Human societies are a product of our evolution as a social species. While many scientists have focused on the negative side of our evolved social life, especially our violent tendencies, that's really only half the story. Physician and social scientist Dr. Nicholas Christakis argues that we have an evolved tendency toward forming good societies where people flourish. In this interview, Dr. Christakis and I discuss this and related ideas from his 2019 book, Blueprint, The Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society. Blueprint has been widely praised by many social scientists, psychologists, and other great thinkers such as Steven Pinker, Jonathan Haidt, Paul Bloom, and many others. Nicholas A. Christakis, MD, PhD, MPH, is the Sterling Professor of Social and Natural Science at Yale University. His work is in the fields of network science, biosocial science, and behavior genetics. He directs the Human Nature Lab and is the co-director of the Yale Institute for Network Science. He was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2006, the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2010, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2017. Dr. Christakis is the author of over 200 articles and several books in addition to this one. His influential book, Connected, The Surprising Power of Our Social Networks and How They Shape Our Lives, documented how social networks affect our lives and was translated into 20 foreign languages. In 2009, Christakis was named by Time Magazine to their annual list of the 100 most influential people in the world. In 2009 and in 2010, he was listed by Foreign Policy Magazine in their annual list of top 100 global thinkers. Now, without further ado, I give you my interview with Nicholas Christakis. Okay, so I'm here with uh, Nicholas Christakis, author of this book, Blueprint, The Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society. I hope we can see that. Um, and we're going to be discussing that book a lot today. So I'm wondering if, can you just give kind of the, the elevator pitch or a brief summary of Blueprint and why you decided to write it? Um, yeah, uh, I thought you were going to ask, I thought you were going to ask you like a direct like uh, question right out of the bank. Uh, I thought you were going to ask something very narrow and specific, not something broad. So I was yeah. preparing myself, I was preparing myself, okay, well, where is he going to go? Which particular stories? No, the overall the overall sort of framing of the book is that in my view, for too long, um, the person on the street and scientists have been obsessed with the dark side of human nature, with our propensity to violence and um, and uh, mendacity and um, and um, selfishness, and that the that the good side has been denied the attention it deserves because equally we are capable of love and friendship and altruism and teaching and all these wonderful qualities. And in fact, I would argue these wonderful qualities have actually predominated in our evolutionary past. Because if, if, if every time I came near you, you uh, were mean to me or, or injured me or stole from me or lied to me or uh, killed me, I would be better off living apart. We would have evolved, you see, to live atomistically, to live not socially, but as individuals. But we didn't evolve that way. And I think the reason for this is that the benefits of a connected life outweigh the costs, that, the, that despite the evil in human beings, the good outweighs the evil. So that's, that's sort of one overarching frame. And then the other overarching frame is that, uh, is that you know, it, it, over the, you know, ever since Darwin and, and Mendel and sort of those greats from the 19th century, you know, we've been making progress in understanding the role of genes in determining, I was going to say human experience, but, you know, animal and plant experience, you know, determining what, you know, the fates of, uh, of living things. And, um, and it's, it's quite clear that um, genes affect the structure and function of our bodies and um, our physiology. And it has become increasingly clear in the last 50 years that genes affect not only the structure and function of our body and hence our minds, but also, but not only the genes affect not only the structure and function of our bodies, but also of our minds and hence our behaviors. In other words, natural selection has played a role in how our brains operate and therefore how we act. And finally, increasingly, it's become clear around the same time period, it's become increasingly clear that genes affect not just the structure and function of our bodies, not just the structure and function of our minds, but also the structure and function of our societies, 
that there's a kind of a role for um, for our gene or for genetics and for a natural selection in how we live socially. Uh, and and that is that sort of that project in what I would call evolutionary sociology is, um, you know, lies at the core of, of the book. Well, thank you for that. That excellent summary. I'm sorry. I put you on the spot there. Um, no, I wasn't. I wasn't expecting <laughs> the elevator pitch. I was expecting, you know, why did you do some other, it doesn't matter. That's fine. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to those specifics for sure. Uh, um, so I, I want to do a little bit of uh, definitions because I'm just interested in how you think about these things. Um, so the, what, the subtitle is uh, the evolutionary origins of a good society, not just any society. So what is a good society um, in your definition? Well, this is something that I tackle actually in the last chapter of the book. Uh, well, I, I, the book talks about the evolutionary origins of qualities uh, or that, um, that arise not within individuals, but between individuals. So for example, I talk about the evolutionary basis of love and friendship and cooperation and teaching and inequality. These are all things that cannot be manifested by individuals. In other words, you love someone else. I mean, you can love yourself, but that's not what I'm interested in. You love someone else. You befriend someone else. You need someone else to cooperate with. You need someone else to teach. You know, you can learn things on your own, but teaching is an inter-individual phenomenon. You, inequality, you know, you can have a certain amount of wealth on your own, of course, or have some other quality, but, but inequality requires a comparison to others. And so all of these are properties that uh, relate to our living in groups and our interdependence. And most of them are what I would argue are good qualities. And most people, you know, would, would agree that love and friendship and so on are nice things and are good things and are features of a good society. So initially, I just sort of take that mostly for granted. But by the end of the book, I do more explicitly tackle the question you just asked. And, uh, and here I draw on some moral philosophers uh, from the middle of the 20th century. Uh, for example, a woman by the name of Philip of Foot, who um, tries after the Second World War, you know, moral philosophy was in crisis because it was very difficult for, for them, the moral philosophers, to explain the great evil that had happened during the Second World War. Was, was there really no objective basis for morality? Was it all about might makes right? You know, the, it's just about like who's stronger. That's the, that's the person that dictates what's right. And that didn't seem a very satisfying answer. So the moral philosophers after the Second World War were really struggling with this. And the, one of the answers advanced by Philip of Foot was that we can understand, and, and this related in turn to something known as the naturalistic fallacy, which is that it cannot be the case that everything that occurs naturally must be good. Uh, because, you know, dying in a woman dying in childbirth is natural, uh, but we wouldn't think of that as good. We would think it would be appropriate to intervene and stop this. So it's not the case that every natural thing is, is a wonderful, you know, good thing. So, um, so one of the advances that Philippa Foote makes is she, she, uh, she begins this magnificent and very famous essay uh, roughly speaking, the essay begins with the following sentence or something like, in moral, in moral philosophy, I think, we should, uh, we should think more about plants. That's approximately the sentence. It's a brilliant, <laughs> just a brilliant opening. You know, wait a minute, we should be thinking about plants and moral philosophy. And her argument is, is that you can think about whether, what goodness means by reference, for example, to the following idea, which is that we can we can refer to the roots of this plant as being good roots if they uh, support the plant, if they help the plant be a plant. Or we can think about a clock as being a good clock if it, um, if it tells the time correctly. So in other words, you can, you can have a sense of goodness or a, a kind of theory of goodness as being about advancing the true purpose of a thing. Hmm. And so since, since I see so a society as having a certain purpose, we can think about those qualities that help society to be optimal, to help society not fall apart, for example. 
And, uh, and trivially, something like friendship, the glue that binds people together, you know, would be required to have a good society. You can't, it's hard, you can't imagine a society where everyone hates each other and kills each other. That would cause a breakdown in the society. Something like that uh, is, is the argument. Got it, got it. So it's sort of a functionally good, a working society uh, is... Well, it's not just working, it's... it's um, well, maybe, uh, and it's not even just enduring, it's a society that's fulfilling its purpose. You know, what are the qualities that a society, you know, what are, what are the features that support a society doing what it, you know, is supposed to do? So the roots are, we can speak of good roots because the roots, you know, absorb nutrients and water and support the plant. And that's why they're good roots and not bad roots. They're furthering the, purpose of the plant or the existence of the plant. Understood. Okay. Well, I want to find, I want to find, if you will allow me just the digression, because I want to find the sentence because I quoted in the book and it's just so beautifully written. Yes. She goes, <laughs> she goes in moral philosophy. It is useful. I believe to think about plants. <laughs> it's just so good. So good. And she argued that there's no fundamental difference between a notion of good whether the topic is a tree having good roots or people being in a good state. The roots have a purpose, a logical constraint that they must satisfy, which sets the standard for deciding whether they are good or not. For instance, humans, animals, and plants are all living things. In all three cases, we can speak of them as being healthy or unhealthy, say, or excellent or defective examples of their kind. And this means that we can characterize the qualities that are conducive to their being healthy or excellent and so on. And we can speak of human virtues such as kindness and bravery in the same way. This is me writing. Um, these virtues are natural excellences and their opposites are natural defects. And so that's in the end, you know, sort of where I land on what it means to be a good society. Uh, okay, yes, yeah, definitely understood. That is that is a great quote though. I'll, I'll remember yeah. that. <laughs> um, well, maybe we can talk about some of those roots, uh, which which I think you call the social suite. Um, so what is that? What is the social suite in a general sense? And then we can get into each of the sort of individual items, each individual features. But what is that, that word, social suite? So the social suite is a... Um is something, I mean, just an expression that I use that, um, that refers to eight fundamental uh, qualities that we express um, between ourselves. So they're not attributes of individuals. For example, religion is not on the list. And the reason is that an individual can be religious. Uh, I mean, we typically practice religion with other people, but you can have religious sentiments, religious beliefs, and religious practice by yourself. Hmm. Whereas you can't have friendship by yourself. You need another person to have friendship, for example. So there are eight qualities that are fundamental to society functioning that uh, are expressed inter, inter individually between individuals and that are uh, partially genetically based. That is to say they've been shaped by natural selection and that are required this suite of factors for, um, for a functioning society. And they are the capacity, paradoxically, the first one is the capacity to um, have and recognize individual identity. One of the weirdest things about living socially, ironically, is that we first of all have to be individuals. And if you think about that, in our species, we communicate our individuality and our identity with our faces. In other words, every person has a different face. And in fact, for the face to to do its job, unlike, say, a kidney, a kidney, every kidney should work the same for kidneys to be functional, but every face should not look the same for faces to be functional. Every face should look different. And it turns out it's an evolutionary luxury for us to have these dissimilar faces. And furthermore, with a huge part of our brain is devoted to the capacity to recognize other people's faces. Um, and in fact, the inability to do so called prosopagnosia is a is a defect is a deficit to not be able to recognize faces and and so we 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 have this a lot of evolved capacity to 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 express different faces to all of us have different faces and to recognize those faces which is another luxury and we do this in part because it's very useful like if you want 
if you want to remember who was mean to you or who was kind to you or who you had sex with or who your children are or who your parents are so that you, or who was nice to you and you'd like to reciprocate the kindness and so on, you need it to have a, a way of signaling, this is me, not someone else, or I recognize you and you're not someone else. So this capacity for individual identity, which we don't do for ourselves, right? It's expressed like I signal to you that I am an individual. I'm not signaling that to myself. That's the first a part of the social suite. Then we have yeah, love. And, yeah. And sorry to, to dig into yeah. that one a little bit. Um, so why is that uh, an important feature of, a, of good societies or of human societies in general? Why do we need that, that individual identity? Well, it's not necessarily a quality of a good society per se, but it's required for a, a good society, right? A, a society in which we were all, let's say, anonymous. I mean, this is stretching the analogy a little, but it's like, if you look at how awful people are online where they're anonymous to each other, that's not very functional, right? Uh, you know, we, we, in order to live together, we have to be able to recognize each other. You know, we are not, we are not like a teeming swarm of ants or of alligators or something, you know, tumbling on each other. We, we, we have and we signal and we recognize individual identity. And that's a very important part of living socially for, for us. And it it's, goes with all the other qualities. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry to cut you off there. Go, no, no, go that's ahead. okay. And no, I'm just, yeah, I mean, that's fine. I mean, just to list the other qualities and we can talk about whatever you want is, uh, so another one is the second one is love, uh, love of partners and offspring. So we, we don't just, um, have sex with each other as all sexually reproducing animals do. We, we form a sentimental attachment to our sexual partners. We love them. And this is uncommon in the animal kingdom. Actually, it's quite common in birds. Uh, well, we don't know if they have a sentiment, but they certainly practice kind of a pair bonding, a kind of monogamy. Uh, but, and it's common in certain other social animals, uh, like, um, like uh, uh, elephants, for example. But uh, we have this capacity to, to form attachments to our uh, sexual partners and to our offspring, which, which, uh, which is love in our species. We have friendships, we have the capacity for friendship. We form social networks, which are the agglomerations of dyadic friendships. And these networks is something I've spent 20 years or 15 years studying, uh, obey very particular mathematical and biological and psychological and social rules. They have very particular patterns uh, that uh, social networks have. We, uh, another element of the social suite, the fifth one is cooperation. We cooperate with each other. We're altruistic, even with strangers and unrelated individuals. We have a, a preference for our own group, which is called in-group bias. It's a little unseemly, let's say, but it's a feature of, it's sort of, and there's this whole set of ideas as to why we have this. We prefer the, you know, the company and presence of our group and tend to be indifferent or, or hostile to other groups. We practice what I call mild hierarchy, so we are intrinsically both egalitarian and hierarchical. We have, I would say, a low level of hierarchy in our species compared to other species, for example. And finally, we engage in this miraculous practice of social learning and teaching. Uh, and this is very rare in the animal kingdom, and we can talk about that too. Anyway, that's the list of eight. I don't know where you want to go, but... Yeah, perfect. I mean, I've got some specific questions for, for some of those and uh, maybe more, more or less on each one. but. Um, but yeah, so so kind of going back to the the love for partners and offspring, uh, you you devote a good amount of that chapter to uh, polygamy versus monogamy, and sort of um, what are humans? Are we naturally monogamous or polygamous? Or that gets a little bit uh, fuzzy, it seems. Yes, well, part of it is first of all we have to distinguish between the number of partners you have. For example, whether that's culturally specified, you know, we're in a polygynous or a polyandrous society, for example, and your attachment to those partners. So what I'm talking about here is whether you have one spouse or several, whether you love that spouse, whether you have a sentimental attachment to the spouse. So it's the first point. The second point, and I, I try to summarize this in the book. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can find the uh, relevant, the relevant uh, 
uh, chapter, a relevant paragraph, because um, because it's 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 a complicated mix of evolutionary biology and culture and history, and and it has to do with the fact that you know multiple uh, factors have shaped our tendency to be monogamous. Um, let me find here. So here we go. I'll just I'll read a, just a chapter because it's e a paragraph because it's easier. Uh, so to summarize, and this is just a very general timeline, our ancestors were polygynous until about 300,000 years ago. So our, our primate ancestors had uh, were polygynous. And this, and we see the signal of that in part is reflected in the fact that the males of our species are so much larger than the females and stronger. And polygyny being a single male with multiple female partners. Multiple females, that's right. And polygyny is seen in quite a number of other primate species. Like gorillas, for example, will have harems. There'll be a big gorilla and smaller female gorillas, and the gorillas will fight with each other. Um, whereas bonobos do not. Bonobos, the men, the bonobos uh, have much more egalitarian sexual lives, and they're similar in size, the males and the female bonobos. Anyway, we were polygynous until about 300 years, uh, 300,000 years ago, and then as our particular um, hominid line, Homo sapiens sapiens, sort of modern humans, evolved about 300,000 years ago, we became primarily monogamous. Uh, and and we were monogamous for a number of reasons I discuss in the book, but one of them had to do with our dispersal and the fact that it was um, easy for both males and females of our species to get the food they needed from the environment. So our hominid ancestors were polygynous. We made the transition to monogamy for a number of reasons, including the benefits for child rearing uh, when uh, when there was a dyadic relationships between the male and the female. So Homo sapiens sapiens beginning about 300,000 years ago was mostly monogamous until the agricultural revolution about 10,000 years ago when we uh, became polygynous again, uh, mostly now for historical reasons, not evolutionary reasons, uh, having to do, for example, with the capacity for a lot of economic inequality that the agricultural revolution gave us, that you know we could have large stores of foods and, uh, and certain uh, rich men could come to control those resources mm -hmm. and and monopolize mating opportunities. So this is when you see all these you know enormous harems, for example, and and uh, polygyny. And it doesn't take a lot of polygyny to to result in many males being locked out of mating opportunities. So that began around ten thousand years ago and persisted till around two thousand years ago, where first the Greeks and then the Romans, for historical reasons, um, shifted back to monogamy, uh, mostly as a because they they uh, rightly concluded that it resulted in decreased violence amongst males and better performance against competing groups that a monogamous a society organized monogamously tended to be able to out compete for example in warfare a society organized polygynously uh now this is this is a gross oversimplification like these four stages that i just outlined and it's very hotly debated by a lot of people but that's the gist. So right now, and, and, and monogamy, which started in Greece and Rome and then sp spread throughout Europe, actually abetted by the Catholic Church in the last 2000 years, and then eventually worldwide, although there are many large populations in our country, which are in our world, which are still polygynous uh, in Africa and Asia, for example. Uh, but for example, I think India permitted polygyny until the 1950s or something. So it was, you know, but, you know, there's still many countries like Indonesia, which is a very populous country, Nigeria, uh, which is a very populous country where polygyny and is legal uh, and um, is, you know, not unnormative. Gotcha. So, wow. That, yeah. that is fascinating. Um, well, another kind of another point on this uh, love for partners and offspring, or it's at least related. There's a chapter on that that you have on intentional communities, um, and you explain that that though this uh, there's this idea of collective parenting that's often tried and it seems to almost always fail or that was the sense yes. i got um so what are the some some of the reasons that people try this and why does it usually not work out so that's that's a set of ideas that straddles two different concerns one concern or topic that i was engaged with there had to do with um whether a group of human beings could deliberately or accidentally 
stumble on a completely different way of living. Let's say one that abrogated the social suite. You know, could we have a society without love? Or could we have a society without friendship? Or could we have a society without cooperation? You know, would it be possible to, you know, live in a way completely out of keeping with our evolved tendency to have a society? And the answer to that is no. Hmm. Uh, and and uh, and as part of that, I looked at the history of intentional communities where groups of people, and we have records of this going back thousands of years, well before Roman times, where groups of people would say, you know, society screwed up. Let's go try again. You know, let's have a commune and live differently. And um, and often communes, communitarian impulses spike during periods of social unrest. I think we may be right now in 20. 22 in the United States being on the cusp of another recrudescence of um, communitarian movements. Often when there's a lot of inequality, when traditional sources of meaning uh, are lost in a society, uh, when there's a lot of uh, stress and disarray, for example, after the pandemic that we've been going through, uh, I would not be surprised. And there's some early indicators that we're going to have a kind of a lot of attempts of groups to live you know, together, to communes, to form again. But this is an old, old phenomenon. And so I review some of this. I look at, um, you know, uh, the Shakers, and I look at uh, Israeli kibbutzes, and I look at uh, uh, Brook Farm, and um, and I look at uh, Walden Two, you know, a more recent uh, a communitarian movement, and uh, Los Horsones. And anyway, I look at a variety of communitarian movements. And in many of them, especially in the kibbutzes, as part of this push to egalitarianism, they would often see the burden that child caring placed on women, and they would try to have communal child rearing. So they would have little places where all the babies and children would go to be raised collectively. So that's one set of topics why I tackle that. And a different set of topics is what you alluded to, which has to do with well, why do we love our kids? You know, why do we feel an attachment to our kids? Why aren't we like, you know, like snakes? You know, we could lay eggs and abandon the young and uh, they could just, you know, slither out on their own and be okay. It's not how we do it. And not only do we raise our young for a prolonged period, but we really love them. You know, we cherish our little kids. And that sense of love that mothers and fathers feel for their children is, uh, is uh, very natural and is uh, universal and uh, is... Uh, uh, necessary uh, for the survival of the children. So, um, so, um, so those are two distinct topics: the kind of bonding we feel with the children, and and uh, and uh, and the emergence of community communes, and they intersect with this issue of communal child rearing, which, as you noted, has always failed. And the reason is that parents really be, want to be with their babies. Mm -hmm. I mean, they love their kids. <laughs> And they don't want to surrender their kids uh, to someone else to raise if they don't have to. So um, and so so, yes, every society that has attempted a communal child rearing, to my knowledge, um, has failed to sustain that. Now, there have been sort of partial successes, but it, they have not been able to sustain it the way they would, you know, in the ex extensive way that many would have wanted. That is that's very interesting. Um... Well, I guess uh, moving on to the, the third item in the, uh, the social suite, which is friendship, um, I found that that was a really fascinating uh, set of chapters because I, hadn't, I really hadn't heard friendship discussed in an evolutionary context. Um, it's something that you mentioned that it's sort of been pushed to the side. And, um, and uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about how, why, why that is or or what your sense of that is. And then um, I want to get to this link that you form between friendship and morality. Uh, that that I have a, a quote from you here. It says, um, our assembly into networks of friendships, uh, friendship ties sets the stage for the emergence of moral sentiments. And that that is a very, um, very intriguing and interesting idea. I wonder if you can explain that and sort of uh, the neglect of friendships in, in the evolutionary sciences. Well, there are, again, two parts to that question. So the first part, you know, all sexually reproducing animals, you know, by definition, mate with each other. 
uh, and and so do we, you know, mammals and humans. We have sex with each other, but we do something that's extremely unusual, <coughs> which is we don't just mate with each other, we befriend each other. We form long-term, non-reproductive unions with other members of, with unrelated other members of our species. Namely, we have friends. These associative ties with genetically unrelated people who we really cherish. Every listener will know what I'm talking about. Um, why do we do that? This is exceedingly rare in the animal kingdom. While sex is quite common, friendship is rare. We do it. Certain other primates do it. Elephants do it both African and Asian elephants, and certain cetacean species, certain dolphins, for example, in orcas that we know of, probably sperm whales too, uh, have friendships. And, um, and, and there's a, a reason that we do it. It has to do with the benefits that come from friendship the, the, in terms of Darwinian fitness, in terms of our survival advantage, one of which is that you learn from your friends your friends can teach you things. And the other of which is that your friends provide a kind of proxy probe for the environment. In other words, if you have a tie with a friend and the friend says it's convivial, I'm speaking now evolutionarily, it's convivial to live here, um, then it's probably convivial for you to live there too. Uh, and, and friends can constantly be generating benefits for us. You know, for example, let's say your, uh, your friend likes a fire to, to stay warm. Well, you could sit by that fire too and also derive a benefit. You know, your friend is, or another example that was given by uh, uh, Tubi and Cosmides is what if you're uh, a woman who's attracting more suitors than she can handle? Well, your female friend could benefit from some of those suitors, you know? So, so your friends have this way of creating what's called positive externalities. They, they create opportunities for their friends, uh, which are advantageous. And um, so, so friendship is this long-term non-reproductive union to unrelated individuals is rare in the animal kingdom, but universal in us. There's like, I review the alleged few exceptions to the existence of friendship. You know, I think there were allegedly six societies out of 700 looked at that, I can't remember the precise numbers, that, you know, for friendship was unknown, but that's actually not quite true. Hmm. Um, so it's universal. It's uh, and some work that my lab has done uh, has looked at the um, genetics of friendship of, uh, uh, you know, uh, how we pick our friends, who we pick as our friends. These are all partially under the control of our genes, which further supports the claim that, you know, they've been shaped by this predilection has been shaped by natural selection. So that's the first part of my answer to your question. The second part of my answer is that if you think about human virtues, many virtues, but not all, many virtues are intrinsically social. I mean, you can be, for example, bravery can be an individual virtue. You can be brave in, 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 in uh, crossing a river on your own or fighting a lion on your own. You know, that can require bravery and that's a virtue and you can express it on your own. But most virtues are social in nature. We, we don't care if you love yourself or are kind to yourself or are just to yourself. We care whether you love others or are kind to others or are just to others. And it's, it's, it's this intrinsic sociality of virtues that is what I mean when I say that, you know, friendship is required or has to do with the emergence of moral sentiments. That in a way that the emergence of our moral sensibilities is tethered to the fact that we live socially in a very particular way, that you know we come to be concerned about the well-being of others, uh, because that's conducive to our being able to live together in the first place. Right, right, and and you mentioned earlier that uh, you've done a lot of work on social networks, um, kind of in a broader sense than just friendships. Uh, so, what, what for people? What are social networks, and maybe what are some of the common features across human cultures? So most people listening to us now in 2022, given social media in the last 20 years, probably every person on the street has an image of what a network looks like. This was like an abstruse part of the social sciences 20 years ago. You know, when I was getting my graduate degree and I was taught about social networks, 
I thought it was really cool, but I'd never really seen a network before. I'd never seen a drawing of a network before. This was 1995 or 94 approximately. And uh, actually the first time I saw a network image that I remember was probably in probably 1992 in a class. I was at the University of Pennsylvania. I just completed my medical training and I had started my PhD in sociology and I was taught a little bit about networks, which is a classic topic in sociology. In fact, as a matter of, of uh, history of science, this is one of the rare areas where ideas emerged in the social sciences and then flowed into the biological and physical sciences. So a lot of the ways that sociologists had of quantifying the structure of human networks were then used by biologists to quantify the structure of genes hmm. or by engineers to describe the structure of, of computer systems. So there's this interesting history of ideas there anyway. Anyway, I was taught this in the, in the 90s, but most people listening now will have, because of social media, will have seen pictures of networks. And a network, of course, is composed of two different types of entities, nodes and ties. The nodes are the individual components like the people, and the ties are what connects the nodes. For example, the friendship connections between people, or it could be computers and wires. You know, here are the here's the internet, here's the servers, and then here are the pipes that connect them. For example, uh, or it could be uh, neurons and the connections between neurons. You could have a network of neurons. For example, in our, our brains, our networks. Uh, you have individual cells, and then the connections between the cells, and there's a little structure you can map. So that's what a network is, uh, and. <clears throat> What's important to understand is that human social networks, that, that online networks are just, are merely a recent instantiation of a much more ancient predilection. I mean, we, we've been making networks for hundreds of thousands of years, social networks. And it's only in the last, you know, hundred years that we've had telephony and telegraphy, and uh, only in the last 20 or 30 years that we've had the internet and social media. So, so the kinds of networks I'm interested in are these face-to-face -face networks, these large ornate structures in which each individual inherits their relatives, but picks their friends and their coworkers and every other person is making similar choices. And then we assemble ourselves into this very ornate and Baroque structure and then proceed to live out our lives embedded in this structure. And our destinies are tied to the structure, you know, whether you, get COVID or not depends on whether your friends, friends, friends got COVID or your coworkers, wife's, you know, sister got COVID and then it'll wind its way to you. So infections, you know, right now you're well, you don't have an illness, but that germ is going to reach you by traversing these network ties. Whether you get useful pieces of information about the location of predators or prey in our ancestral past or about where to find a, a job. If you lost your job in modern society, depends on where you are in the network and on and on. So, so our fates are tied to these networks that we live in. Um, and, and we evolved to, to make these networks and these networks are, 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 are a superstructure that transcends individuals or, or even dyads or, or even pairs of individuals. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and um, sort of the next item in the social suite is cooperation. And that certainly uh, social networks are heavily uh, have, have a lot of co cooperation involved in them. But I, I want to skip over that one just a little bit um, okay. in interest of time. But uh, so the, the sixth item is the preference for one's own group or in group bias. Yeah. And as you mentioned, that one is a little bit uh, contentious. So, I mean, maybe to just, just put a fine point on it, uh, it, it does seem like problems like political polarization and, and prejudice generally are at least partly driven by in-group bias. Um, so would it be better if we, if we didn't have this particular trait or how, is, how, does it, uh, how does it help us to have good societies? So the thing is, the thing about in-group bias is that some of it seems to be necessary for the emergence of cooperation. And um, now there's a big difference between favoring your own group and killing the other group, right? I mean, it's possible to imagine that you love your own group and are indifferent, let's say, to other groups. You know, there, there's a big difference between loving your own group and enslaving other groups or taking them to ovens. 
Um, so, so where does this in-group love and out-group hostility come from and what purpose did it serve? Well, one of the theories has to do with the way that in-group bias, similar, by the way, to social networks, and we didn't discuss this, does something which is technically called as adding structure to a population, which facilitates the emergence of cooperation. Let me give you an example. Imagine you had a group of a thousand, a population of a thousand people, and I dropped you in this population, and I said, well, everyone should be nice to each other. You know, be altruistic, give of your own resources to others, and hopefully they'll reciprocate. Well, if I drop you into this population, you might start by being nice to other people, but you might never bump into the person you were nice to again, right? You might, I might help you out or give you a loan or do something nice for you, hoping that I, you would reciprocate, but maybe I'll never see you again because it's a group of a thousand people and I'm bumping into all of these thousand people. Or maybe if I did, you wouldn't remember me or recognize me because a thousand people is a lot of people to track, uh, you know, all their faces and everything else. It's not so easy to remember a thousand faces, who they are. It's easy to tell the difference between a thousand faces, which is a different topic, which we talked about earlier, but to actually remember the names and personal information of a thousand people is not so easy. Now, instead of that, imagine that I took these thousand people and I divided them into 10 groups of a hundred and gave each group a colored flag to hold above their heads, a purple flag or a green flag or you know, a brown flag or whatever. So they're each holding a flag above their head. And now I, and so, oh, I'm sorry. So in the population of a thousand, I'm telling everyone, everyone should be nice to everyone else. And we find that actually nobody is nice to anyone else. There's no cooperation in this society because it's, there's no structure to it. Uh, it's too difficult. It's too daunting a challenge as we just discussed. So cooperation level is zero, let's say. Now imagine, like I was just saying, you divide up this population into 10 groups of hundred You give every group a different colored flag. And now you tell everybody, you know what? Just be nice to the people that are holding up the same colored flag as you. Now the challenge is much easier for everybody. You're in a small group of 100. You can remember those 100 people. You only have to be nice to 100. You don't have to be nice to 1,000. You're not spreading your efforts uh, very thinly. You can count on those people to help you because they're also part of your small group and so on. And so now you might find that by this little simple expedient of adding a little structure, partitioning the group of 1,000 into, into 10 groups of 100, the average cooperation in the population of 1,000 will be much higher. So structuring the population, restricting the social vision of each individual within it, paradoxically enhances the ability of all the people to cooperate and benefit from cooperation. So this is one of the theories. And by the way, we didn't mention this, this is also one of the reasons that friendship is so important. Because when I ask you to be nice to others, mostly you're nice to people you know. You're mostly nice to your friends. You make sacrifices for your friends. You're, we are also nice to strangers some, but we really care about our kin and our friends. Those are the ones that we really care about. And everyone is that way. So therefore everyone has some benefit from this. And it's totally different than if I said to you, you know, go forth and be nice to every single person you encounter, which would be much more of a challenge. That is, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And it kind of, for me, opens up this idea of, um, I don't know, for, for lack of a better phrase, th this idea that's kind of thrown around that, that diversity is always a kind of a strength of a society. And I wonder uh, how- I'm not sure that's true, right. yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, I, I wonder, maybe you can explain your thoughts on that, on, on why it, it isn't sometimes, or, or how should we think about having different factions within one society that have different ideas about, say, hierarchy or- um, Yes. Or, or those sorts of things. How, how well, do you think about well, that? One of, the, one of the things that's really important to understand about this is that how we define who's in the in-group and who's in the out-group is, is arbitrary. We, we have an evolved capacity to do that, but what lines we choose to be relevant, for example, religion, you know, that's arbitrary. It doesn't need to be religion, uh, but it often is. Or clothing, you know, attire, you know, different groups dress differently, for example. Uh, and, and you can recognize members of your own group by similar attire. And then you say, wait a minute, those aren't my group, there's someone else. You know, armies do this, right? Different armies have different uniforms. So you tell our guys from the other guys, you know? We're seeing in Ukraine now, they're wearing armbands, you know, because they look similar and speak similar language. They have to tell, tell the difference, you know? I'm a Ukrainian, I'm a Russian, and they have 
every day. And plus, you know, to avoid infiltration, they have different passwords and different color armbands, or they put the, sometimes they put them on their feet, you know, to signal who they are and so on. So, so what is taken to be relevant is arbitrary. You know, right now in our society, race and ethnicity and politics, for example, are taken as the salient um, factors that seem to be structuring our interactions with each other. But the choice of those is largely arbitrary. First point. Uh, second point, in terms of um, the ability of groups of people to work together, typically, the, unfortunately, I mean, this is depressing, the scientific literature generally shows that it's groups perform better when they are of like kind, you know, when you feel like everyone is part of your own group. Now, you can redefine that. You can have people that look physically different, but we're all the same religion, for instance. Well, that's fine. Uh, you know, or we, uh, we all have different religions and different appearance, but we're all the same country. You know, we're all Americans, for example. Well, that's fine. Uh, but it's this is you know the the the, the it's, it's 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 the being similar on whatever axis has been privileged that tends to make groups perform better uh, in general. Now that has to do with the ability of the groups to work together. One of the arguments for which there's a bit more evidence is that groups that are intellectually diverse or ideologically diverse can be more innovative in terms of their ideas, which is often very useful for groups. You know, like if you have a, it helps to avoid groupthink, for example. Now this does not mean you need to, for example, be racially diverse in order to do better science, for example, or you don't need to be religiously diverse in order to keep a boat from sinking, you know, uh, for example. But if you're trying to prevent a boat from sinking, maybe rather than religious diversity, maybe you want engineering diversity. You need some chemical engineers and some mechanical engineers and some biological engineers. You, know, you need different kinds of engineering ability, for example, to keep a boat from sinking. Uh, whereas if you only had one kind of engineer, that might not be what you really need to keep a boat from sinking, for example. So, so it, this is subtle. And it, so these things, you know, it's important to be clear and it's complicated, uh, basically, uh, to answer your question. So, um, so there's a lot of sloppy conflation where they people say, well, diversity is necessarily good. You have to say diversity of what and for what challenge. And now let me just finish with one last thing, which is if you're thinking about the political challenges in our society right now and um, the fact that so many groups are at each other's throats and that we seem to be facing not just in the United States, but even worldwide, a lot of conflict between groups. There are at least a couple of different ways you can solve this conflict that are based on um, our evolution. And one I've alluded to already. So let's say you have groups in the United States that are in conflict with each other. One solution to the conflict is to go up a level and to say, yes, well, we're different religions or different immigration status or different sexual orientation. Yes, but we're all Americans, right? And this is, this is a kind of phenomenon that's been understood, certainly since de Tocqueville, uh, that you can, you, can def and, and, and you can exploit the human capacity to have arbitrary boundaries and define it up. So we're all seen as part of the same group. And when you do that, you can foster cooperation within the group. And this is, of course, also a trope in science fiction. You know, when the aliens invade, previously all of humanity were different countries were fighting against each other. Now we have a common enemy. We all, we all see ourselves as humans. Uh, and we're all going to fight against these aliens, for example. And, uh, and in the book, I give some other examples of this, where, where you can bind groups together by having a, a new external threat, uh, a kind of a shared threat. and. Uh, and I talk about a famous demonstration of this called the robber's cave demonstration. But anyway, so, so one of the challenges, one of the ways to, to confront the challenge of intergroup conflict is to go up a level and define the groups as we're all part of the same, redefine it so that we're all part of the same group. And this has been understood feature of our society for a long time. And a feature, by the way, as Americans, those of us that are Americans, we can be proud of, which is that we believe that anyone can be an American. You know, it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what your religion is. You just have to sort of basically agree to the American project, you know, sign on to the Bill of Rights, and um, you can become an American. And it's, it's, a, it's an extraordinary innovation in history 
uh, that um, has taken place in the last two or 300 years in our society. Okay, so that's one solution. Another solution, which we also alluded to, but not in this context a little while ago, is instead of going up a level from these groups is to go down a level and to efface the differences by moving to the level of the individual. And this also has a history in our society, and this was classically expounded by Martin Luther King Jr., who said, I would rather have people, my children judged by the content of the character than the color of their skin. What he's saying is each person should be treated as an individual. Uh, and we also have the evolutionary capacity. We, as we said earlier, we recognize each other as individuals and, uh, and treating each other as individuals is another way to efface group difference and the awful impact that intergroup conflict is having in our society at the moment. It seems ascendant again, unfortunately. Yes, yeah, definitely. And I mean, it's, it's interesting to note that uh, the American project, as you describe it, is both one of um, kind of unity, but also recognizing that the individual is that, that kind of classical liberal idea um, at the heart of it. Um, and this uh, this goes to by the way, lest we be misunderstood, I can hear some listeners already saying, but it wasn't always the case that political rights were extended to everyone. Of course they weren't. Yes. I understand that, right? I mean, women couldn't vote. We had slavery in our society. I'm well aware of all of the uh, ways in which the so-called American project didn't fulfill its hallowed ideals from the start. But those ideals were nevertheless extraordinary. And it is precisely those ideals that have, you know, that we are continuing to endeavor to form a more perfect union, as the founder said. And in fact, if anything, it is those liberal ideals that started in Europe in the 18th and 19th century and then spread around the world that have, in fact, progressively given us the kind of free societies that we increasingly have today. Um, you know, slavery was, uh, for example, was um, a worldwide phenomenon for thousands of years. There's still chattel slavery in the world today. About 40 million people are enslaved around the world today including born into slavery, which is just extraordinary. And it doesn't get the attention it deserves. There are more slaves in the world today than there were in the Civil War, during the period of the Civil War. Um, and it was, and slavery was ultimately undone, actually as a, as a legacy of these um, dead white male enlightenment philosophers, you know, who's many of whom had slaves, by the way. Uh, but, you know, they expounded a set of ideals that slowly but surely chipped away at a kind of um, awful othering, uh, you know, of other groups to the point where we could exterminate them or enslave them or colonize them. Slowly but surely, the seeds of the destruction of those awful ideas was laid by these philo philosophers um, from the um, from the 18th and 19th century. Kind of going back a step, um, you talk about. Um, some of the the efforts in the in the twentieth century to kind of socially engineer society, uh, yes. according to um, you know whether it was Mao Zedong or uh, Soviet Union, um, w what happened? Why are those um, failures? What does your view of human nature have to say about efforts like that? I think that totalitarian ideologies. <coughs> or extreme ideologies, whether on the far left or on the far right, that think that it's possible to make a new man, you know, that it's possible to create a new kind of society. And by the way, people seeing the video would see when I said a new man, I was kind of, you know, making a face that recognized that we meant a new human, but it used to be called a new man. And whereas people listening to the audio may not catch that. But anyway, you know, the, it was phrased as a new man, but of course they meant a new human. But anyway, to, to make a, a new kind of person or a new kind of society, whether, whether driven by ideolo ideologies on the far left or on the far right, to the extent that those ideologies were not in keeping with the social suite, to the extent that they were swimming against our fundamental and innate sociality, they were doomed to failure. And I give some examples of this. So for example, a lot of totalitarian ideologies try to efface individual identity. You know, everyone is supposed to dress the same. You know, we're all going to wear Mao jackets, for example. We're going to call each other comrade, you know, as if it's interchangeable. These, this doesn't work, okay? People, people like to be individuals as well. I mean, they love to be part of groups. We love to surrender our individuality from time to time. 
but we also like to be individuals. Um, the efforts, for example, interestingly, the family is often seen as a threat to these types of ideologies because you're supposed to only be committed to the leader, uh, like as we see in right wing populism. You know, you're you're supposed to really care about who is the leader, or you know, in in left far left communism, you know, you're supposed to care about the party, for example, uh, but and not your family. So the family you see becomes a threat to these types of ideologies. So a lot of these ideologies try to break down. Uh, the commitments people naturally feel to their families. Uh, and, um, or you get, for instance, like in, in East Germany, uh, the Stasi, you know, the, the, the secret police were so um, effective that people were really afraid to have friendships because, you know, you never knew who was a spy. Something like 40% of the population were Stasi informants. So if you told your friend something you and I would consider to be, I, I'm not sure about the statistic, it's some large fraction, but if, if, if you know if you and I might just naturally speak intimately to one of our friends about our concerns without having a concern that they would be report us to the authorities and would be hauled off to prison imagine if you had that fear it would really try to stop the natural tendency to friendship all of these efforts you see doom in my judgment doom those political ideologies to failure you cannot for a little while you can succeed, but you cannot for a long time succeed in remaking society anew in a fashion that is inconsistent with these natural tendencies. You know, it's a little bit like, you know, you can starve a child and stunt its growth as a result, but the genes for height in that child are still in that child and will be passed to its grandchildren, its children and its grandchildren. And as soon as the environment returns to Having enough food again, those children will be tall. Uh, you know, you can't, it takes a tremendous cultural pressure, a, you know, a threat of arms uh, or, you know, a vast uh, secret police to, um, to suppress and then only temporarily these kinds of, uh, you know, natural uh, in inklings. Same, by the way, with mild hierarchy. You know, you cannot make a society completely egalitarian for a whole host of reasons. One of which is, as Thomas Jefferson realized, we are, we're all, there's variation in natural talents. You know, some people are just born more musical or more athletic or smarter than others. And, um, and you can't equalize them all. And nor is it into our advantage to equalize them all. I, I derive benefit from those individuals that, unlike me, who have musical ability, you know, who were born with musical talent and can play beautiful music and spend their lives doing that. That's very lucky for me that they exist. Um, and, and it would be an awful world in which everyone had to have the same low level of musical ability <laughs> as me. Uh, so, you know, anyway, so, so that's another reason you can't deface uh, hierarchy completely either. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. And, and that point about mild hierarchy um, it it kind of goes to something you mentioned about wealth and, and income inequality. Um, and I think it was an experiment by your lab about uh, how examining kind of wealth inequality and how the visibility of that could affect yes. cooperativity or cooperation and group cohesion. Um, so can you kind of drill into that, that visibility part? Why is it that the, the actual so visibility... Depressing. Yes. That experiment that experiment really depressed me. Uh, that paper was published in uh, in Nature, I think, in 2015 or something like that. So what we did in that paper, and I discuss it in the book, we have some software in my lab that we've developed and that we make publicly available called Breadboard. And uh, you can learn more about Breadboard at breadboard.yale.edu. And Breadboard is a kind of software that's integrated with Amazon Mechanical Turk and other online labor markets so that a scientist can, can design temporary artificial societies composed of real people that you recruit, let's say on Amazon Mechanical Turk or elsewhere, who then come to your online lab for a period of time, let's say an hour, and you drop them into these societies and you can manipulate in a kind of godlike way different aspects of those societies to do experiments. For example, you could drop them into a network, take 100 people and drop them into a network of one structure, Take the same or different hundred people and drop them into a network of another structure and test whether the structure of social interactions affects the ability of groups to relay information or cooperate or work together or whatever. 
So a few years ago, we were we became interested in looking at this topic of inequality, economic inequality, because there's a lot of interest in this topic right now and a lot of claims about how economic inequality is corrosive. And it is. It's bad for our health. It's bad for our solidarity, our sense of we -ness, you know, that we are together. You know, as you get higher and higher levels of inequality, it kind of breaks at the political fabric. So, but the problem is a lot of the research on this topic relies on observational data, where we go out and we look at different groups that are unequal economically, and then we see what else is going on with them. So maybe we find a group that's economically unequal and they're not cooperative. Well, which comes first? Are they non-cooperative and then they become unequal or are they unequal and then they become non-cooperative? You can't really tell with observational data. So we said, well, why don't we do some experiments? So we used this software. We took a, I don't remember how many people, a few hundred, maybe about a thousand people. And we dropped them into, I don't remember how many groups, like a dozen, a few dozen groups, 60 groups or something. I don't remember, maybe 80 groups. And uh, we experimentally manipulated the level of inequality. We gave these people real money to play a game and we dropped them into these social networks that we constructed. And so people came for about half an hour and they were in this temporary artificial society. We gave them some real money to play with. We introduced them to some of their neighbors. Each person had different neighbors in each group. And they played something known as a public goods game, which is uh, a game in which if they are kind to their neighbors by sharing their wealth, that wealth gets doubled. So all of their neighbors do better but they paid a little bit of a sacrifice. And so the best outcome is if everyone sacrifices, then the whole group thrives and gets richer and richer. But of course, from an individual perspective, it's more rational to be selfish, to not give any money and hope everyone else contributes resources. It's a pub, something called the public goods game. So, and then we experimentally manipulated how much inequality there was. So we had a Gini, which is a measure of inequality of zero, means everyone has the same amount of money of 0 0.2, which is sort of Swedish level of inequality, or a Gini of 0 0.4, which is American or Moroccan level of inequality, more extreme level, more difference between the rich and the poor. And we manipulated whether you could see your neighbor's wealth or not. So you always could see your own wealth. So we had a, something called a two by three factorial design. We had six different kinds of groups. We manipulated the inequality. We manipulated whether you could see the neighbor's wealth or not. And I really expected when we did this experiment, and then we measured how much wealth could these societies produce, how many friends, how friendly were they, and how cooperative were they, how generous were they. And I really expected the inequality to be bad. And it was a little bit bad, but really not that much. What really mattered was whether you could see your neighbor's wealth or not. And when you made wealth invisible, when you couldn't see how rich your neighbors were, the societies did better. So, uh, and this was a very depressing conclusion for me, it kind of broke my egalitarian heart uh, because we, you know, we did not show that inequality, at least in this experiment, was that bad. What really mattered is whether you could see it. And, and this actually fits with some other things that many people, including the listeners, might have observed, which is that, for example, if you think about pay transparency in firms, if you publicize how much money everyone gets, the, the salary paid to every individual, if the, if, the, if the amount is very unequal, you know, if the managers are getting a lot more money than the line workers, that's gonna sap the collective will of the people to work together in the firm. So with high levels of inequality, it turns out pay secrecy is better. On the other hand, if everyone is getting paid about the same, mm -hmm. pay transparency is better. If, if the line worker, like nowadays, a typical CEO makes something like 500 times a typical line worker. It's like extremely unequal. But in Japan or in certain Scandinavian countries, a CEO might make, let's say, 20 times what a line worker makes. So if it's, if it's that level of inequality, then making the pay transparent actually increases the ability of people to work together. Or if you think about school uniforms, I used to be really against school uniforms because they struck me as vaguely fascistic like you know and we should allow people to express their individuality and dress how they want and so on but the problem with with that is that people compete whereas a school uniform is like an invisibility cloak everyone is dressed the same everyone has the same shoes we don't allow jewelry you're here to learn and um, and actually it reduces conflict by having school uniforms actually sort of interesting 
So um, anyway, so that's those are the results of those those experiments. That is that is just fascinating, and it's a, a great point to end on. Um, except, I, I do want to ask you one last quick question. I I always enjoy your writing and your speaking, and especially this book. And um, it's just a, a wonderful tour of all, a lot of the ideas and, and a lot more that we haven't covered. I mean, and I'm wondering if you have any tips for somebody who's a, a science writer like me, a science communicator. How do you what lessons do you have for people um, communicating science to a general audience? Uh, well, I think the first step is to understand the topic as deeply as you can. Um, it's very hard to communicate ideas effectively if you don't understand them yourself. And that often requires a lot of study and conversation with others, especially people more expert than oneself. Um, and then the second, you know, very commonplace thing is to tell it with stories, right? I mean, um, you know, try to give vivid examples. You know, one, one set of examples we didn't discuss, which people love about the book, which I thought for sure you'd bring up was the shipwreck stories. Uh, that, you know. that, yes, that is, I, I love that part of the book. I, there was, uh, that if, if we had more time, that would definitely get on the list of the question. Right, well, the, I mean, the, the shipwrecks, I, I studied, you know, unintentional societies or groups of people who were stranded on faraway places, you know, in the period between 1500 and 1900 to see what kind of societies they were able to make, sort of a natural experiment. Now, I went to that topic initially for scientific motivations, but you know, I, I was aware that it's sort of a vivid and interesting topic. And so it kind of turned into the swerve and used some of those stories to engage the listener, but also in Geralia, try to communicate some of the underlying scientific points. So I think, I think you know, knowing the topic deeply and then, um, and then trying to tell it with stories. And then of course, the usual stuff like avoiding jargon, shorter sentences, like it's taken me a long time, I still am struggling with this to write in shorter sentences. Steven Pinker and Dan Gilbert are magnificent at this. Uh, you know, they, they have very complicated ideas, but they, have, they give you a short sentence pause, short sentence pause, short so you can really internalize it as you're, as you're going along. You know, uh, Jared Diamond, of course, is phenomenal, uh, you know, telling, uh, so he, you know, has many examples and he weaves together this, this long arc. So um, um, uh, Richard Dawkins, of course, is phenomenal, right? I mean, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, he, Richard uses these extraordinary uh, metaphors that's another thing. So you say, oh, you know, like um, he has this, um, uh, you know, um, well, I mean, all of it. I mean, his whole, he has so many metaphors. I mean, I was going to pick a couple, but but then I'd have to go down the rabbit hole and explain <laughs> the metaphors, which I'm not sure I want to do right now. But anyway, so the use of metaphors is very important. You know, analogies, you know, what would be uh, to, to make a more complicated idea simpler uh, so that people could, uh, you know, relate to it. So. Anyway, those are, I guess, I some some things I'm still trying to do better uh, as I try to, you know, be a better science communicator. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you. Good advice for me. Um, all right. Well, Nicholas Christakis, thank you so much. Uh, it's been great talking to you. Th thank you so much for having me, Andrew. Uh, the, just the time whipped by. Uh, but thank you very much for having me and, and good luck to your endeavors. Thank you. You too. All right, well, that is it. Thank you so much for listening to or watching this episode of Sense of Mind. Please be sure to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel and to the podcast. Also consider giving this show a five-star rating on whatever podcast platform you use. As always, this channel is brought to you by the Diamond Mind Foundation. This episode was written and produced by me, Andrew Cooper Sanson. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.